Will longitudinal biomarker optimization improve health and extend lifespan? So with that in mind, let's start off today's video with biological clocks. And more specifically, there are a few generations of biological clocks. First and second generation biological clocks were derived from cross-sectional data with the goal of predicting chronological age and or all-cause mortality risk, ACM risk. Now, some examples of that include the blood biomarker-based PhenoAge and Aging.ai, which I regularly present on this channel, but also epigenetic tests, including Horvath, Hanum, DNA, M, or, or PhenoAge, the epigenetic test that corresponds to PhenoAge, and GrimAge. Now, third generation biological clocks may be better, and that's because they're derived from longitudinal data. And as far as I know, there's only one uh, clock, one longitudinal based clock or third generation clock that it currently exists. And that's Dunedin PACE, which is an epigenetic test that measures the pace of epigenetic aging that was derived from the Dunedin study, which was a longitudinal study. Or in other words, it was, de it was derived based on measurements in the same people many times, many tests over time, rather than cross-sectional data. But note that there aren't any yet third generation biological clocks for blood-based biomarkers. So we can easily assess that by evaluating our own biomarker changes or their stability over time, and then comparing that to published values. And by doing that, I expect that we can help address that question, will longitudinal biomarker optimization improve health and extend lifespan by optimizing our own biomarkers over time. So in, the, in today's video, I'm gonna focus on three biomarkers, and by no means is this a comprehensive overview by just looking at three biomarkers. There are many biomarkers of many organ systems that I intend on covering by looking at longitudinal data. So just as a brief intro, glucose is a measure of metabolic health and or function. Albumin is a measure of hepatic or liver health and or function. And the RDW or red blood cell distribution width is a subdivision of erythrocytes or red blood cells, which would qualify them as an immune related marker. So let's jump into the data. So glucose increases during aging. So that's what we're looking at here. Mean levels of fasting glucose or average levels of fasting glucose on the y-axis plotted against age on the x. And this is over the 18 to 88 year old range. And this is in a very large study of 12.5 million people. So in terms of that age-related increase for glucose, we can see that in youth, values around 85 milligrams per deciliter for men in green and women in red that then increase to greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter in 88-year-olds. So from that same study, lowest all-cause mortality risk was identified as 80 to 94 milligrams per deciliter. So then we can then define our longitudinal glucose goals, which would be to avoid the age-related increase and then consistently stay within that 80 to 94 milligram per deciliter range. Now note that the reference range, at least based on the Quest, uh, on Quest Lab, is 65 to 99 milligrams per deciliter. So if we only focused on the reference range, we may miss these longitudinal trends. So with that in mind, what's my data? So I have glucose data that goes all the way back to 2006. So this is 17 years of data. And more specifically, the little n is how many blood tests that I have over that time period. So I have 45 venipuncture blood tests. This is not finger prick since 2006. And we can see that there is a positive correlation with the correlation coefficient of 0.26, but it's just outside of statistical significance with a p-value of 0.09. So one reason why glucose isn't significantly correlated with age in my data, although that trend line is definitely uh, increasing, is because of improvements in 2022, which are further illustrated here. So on the top of the columns, we've got year or group of years, num uh, number of tests in the middle, and then the average glucose over those tests for a given time period in the far right column. And we can see that indeed my glucose levels did increase from the 80s into the 90s as highlighted in red for the glucose levels in the 90s. But then in 2022, I've been able to somewhat reverse that with an average glucose level of 89 milligrams per deciliter over six tests. So another way to look at this data is that my average glucose level over these 45 tests is 89.6. So if we plot that on the graph, we can see that that's the expected value for someone around 30 years old. In contrast, for someone of my current chronological age or over the chronological age period that all of these blood tests were accrued with the red arrow, a blood glucose level of closer to 100 would be expected. So an argument can be made that my current 
or, or my average glucose levels over the past 17 years are about 20 years younger than expected based on chronological age. So in terms of longitudinal glucose goals, in terms of avoiding the age-related increase, uh, with the, if, if I didn't have 2022 data, that would be an X. But because of 2022, I've given that a check. What about consistently staying within the 80 to 94 milligram per deciliter range? So for that, we put up the range bars uh, on the graph there, 80 to 94. And we can see that most of the data, most of the uh, dots, which are each... Uh, correspond to an individual blood test, we can see that most of them are within that range. More specifically, 37 of the 45 blood tests are within the 80 to 94 range, or 82% of all tests are within the lowest all-cause mortality risk range. So I've given that a check. So this is just one biomarker example. And then I think that by using this approach for multiple, mo multiple biomarkers for as many organ systems as possible, this can help assess one systemic rate of aging or potentially slow it down thereby either improving health and or lifespan. So albumin declines during aging, biomarker number two in this analysis. So we've got serum levels of albumin on the y-axis plotted against age, and the age range for this study went from birth all the way up to centenarian status or, or 100 years old. And note that this is in also a very large study of about 1.1 million people. Alb albumin levels peak in youth with values for women around 45, with, and for men, about 46 grams per liter, after which they decline during aging, as shown there, such that centenarians have values approaching 36 grams per liter. Now, the reference range, and again, using Quest's uh, reference range, is 36 to 51 grams per liter. So if we only focused on the reference range, we would miss the age-related decline for albumin, as centenarians would be within range, and the youthful levels would be in range. So we would miss the age-related decline by only focusing on the reference range. Now, in a different study, and I link to this study and all the other studies in this video in the video's description, so if you're interested in that, check it out, but lowest all-cause mortality risk in a relatively large study of a few hundred thousand people for, for albumin with all-cause mortality risk was in the 45 to 48 grams per liter range. So with those data, the aging and all-cause mortality data, we can define our longitudinal albumin goals, which are to avoid the age-related decline and consistently stay within the 45 to 48 grams per liter range. So what's my data? So for albumin, I have data that goes back to 2005. So I have 46 blood tests over that 18-year period. And here we can see a significant increase for albumin with a correlation coefficient of 0.3. And you can see that that p-value is less than 0.05. So it's a significant increase, uh, increase in correlation. In other words, over time, I've been able to increase my albumin levels. So in terms of the longitudinal albumin goals, we can see that I've resisted the age-related decrease for albumin. And instead, I have a significant increase. But that may not necessarily be good. So in terms of the longitudinal albumin goals, the other one is to consistently stay within that 45 to 48 grams per liter range, which is associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. So how well have I done for that? So, so we put the range on the chart, and we can see that um, not all of the dots are within that 45 to 48 uh, gram per liter range. And I should say the units on my chart are, are in grams per deciliter, so we just divide grams per liter by 10 to get the same data. More specifically, in terms of falling within the 45 to 48 grams uh, per liter range, eight, only 18 of the 40, my 46 blood tests since 2005 have been within that range, or 39%. So for that, I've given that an X. So I've got a lot of room to improve to consistently stay within the 45 to 48 range for albumin. Now, that's important because albumin greater than 49 grams per liter or 4.9 grams per deciliter is associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk from that same study, the LIND 2020 paper. If, if there is good news, my last two tests, I've been doing a better job of keeping albumin within that range. I've had albumin levels of 4.6 and 4.8 grams per, per deciliter. So uh, next up, we've got the RDW. So the red blood cell distribution width is shown here plotted on the y-axis against age. In this, in this case, we've got uh, younger than 50 years grouped into one category at the far left, all the way up past 100 years. So we've got centenarians in this study of about 4,700 people. And if anybody's come across the largest, uh, larger studies for how the red blood cell distribution with changes during aging, please leave it in the comments because this is the largest study that I was able to find. So the RDW percent increases during aging as shown for men in blue and women in red. And you can see that correlation coefficient of 0.32. And the p-value is very low, 1 times 10 to the negative 253. 
the reference range for Quest uh, using Quest Lab is 11 to 15%. So again, if we only focused on the reference range, we would miss that age-related or mostly miss the age-related increase for, for the RDW. And we can see that here by using the 15% as a cutoff, only one age group, the male centenarians, have a median RDW that would be higher than the reference range. Although there are some older groups that have some overlap, the median values are only past 15% for, that, for the centen centenary men as shown on this plot. For everybody else, it's the median values were lower than 15%. Now, in terms of lowest all-cause mortality risk in a study of more, more than 3 million people, that was shown to be uh, with a, an RDW of less than 12.5%. So with the aging and all-cause mortality data, we can define our longitudinal RDW goals, which would be to avoid the age-related increase and consistently keep RDW percent less than 12.5. So how well have I done with that? What's my data? So here we've got the RDW plotted against age, and I've got RDW data that goes back to 2003. So this is 20 years of data with 43 blood tests over that time span. And here we can see a non-significant uh, inverse correlation for the RDW uh, versus age. In other words, in my data, the RDW percent is not significantly correlated with age. So in terms of our longitudinal RDW goals, we can see that I've, I've avoided the age-related increase as RDW has not increased over time in my data. All right, what about consistently keeping the RDW percent less than 12.5? So for that, we go to 12.5 as the cutoff, and we can see just visually, we can see that about half the dots seem to be above the line, and about half seem to be below that. More specifically, 24 were uh, below it, and 43 uh, of 20, 24 of the 43 blood tests were below 12.5 or 56%. So I do have some room for improvement there. Now the good news is that for all six tests so far in 2022, my RDW percent has been less than 12.5. And my average RDW over that over those six tests is 12%. So I'm on the right track with my current diet in terms of keeping my RDW relatively low. Now, if there's a weakness in this approach, it's that I've used cross-sectional aging and all-cause mortality data in this study or, or in this video. But note that the longitudinal and cross-sectional data largely agree. But the cross-sectional studies that I've shown in this video have far larger sample sizes. In other words, longitudinal studies may have a few thousand people with repeated measures over time but which would be the stronger way to present the data? Is it with a study of 12.5 million people cross-sectionally or with a study of 2,000 people that has only a few data points per person over a, over a 20-year span? So uh, I've decided in this video to show the cross-sectional data just by sheer number of sample size uh, being greater than what's found in the longitudinal studies. So this is just a part one of this series as I've only gone over three biomarkers. I'll cover more biomarkers using, using the longitudinal goals in future videos. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned for part two and even maybe parts three through seven and beyond. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got some discount links that you may be interested in. Epigenetic testing, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing, diet tracking, or if you would just like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee, and all of these links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.